on world news tonight. Escalating crisis. Rohingya refugees meet protests in Indonesia as arrivals grow. Beyond the road. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak faces resistance on his signature immigration policy. Fossil fears. COP28 falls short of a phase out plan for fossil fuels as talks grow to a close. And Disney Christmas. Disneyland Hong Kong kicks off the Christmas celebrations with beloved characters and dazzling roles. is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin tonight's broadcast with updates on the escalating Rohingya crisis. Myanmar's Rohingya people are facing a wave of hostility and rejection in Indonesia, where regional communities say they are fed up with a spike in the numbers of boats carrying the persecuted ethnic minority to their shores. Rohingya refugees are facing a wave of hostility and rejection in Indonesia, like this protest on the island of Sabang in Aceh province. People in Aceh were for years sympathetic to the persecuted minority from Myanmar, who turned up on dilapidated boats. But there's been a spike in arrivals and a backlash. Protesters last week tore down tents and threatened to push boats back into the sea, according to images shown on local television. Babar Baluch, an Asia spokesperson for the UN Refugee Agency, said UNHCR was alarmed by the reports. Local resident Ella Septia accuses the Rohingya of causing trouble. Aceh has many poor people, she says. Why should we take care of thousands of Rohingya? For years, Rohingya have left Buddhist-majority Myanmar, where they are generally seen as interlopers, denied citizenship and subjected to abuse. Mohammed Hassim arrived in mid-November after 14 days at sea. He says he fled dangerous conditions in Bangladesh's Cox's Bazaar refugee camp, only to meet hostility in Aceh. We were intimidated, he says, and had to come here. So we have to put up with whatever the Indonesian administration and the public do to us. Our future is in their hands. Hazara Hatun also left Bangladesh. I'm afraid that we'll be forced to leave Aceh. I left all my family there, and I don't know where else to go. More than 1,200 Rohingya have landed in Indonesia since November, UNHCR data shows. At least 300 more arrived last weekend, some of whom local media said were moved to the office of the provincial governor, after the community in Aceh's Besar district rejected them. A spokesperson for the Aceh government did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Indonesian President Joko Widodo said his country would take firm action against human traffickers, whom he blamed for the surge in arrivals. He promised to work with international organisations to offer temporary shelter. In a surprising turn of events, French lawmakers rejected Emmanuel Macron's plan to overhaul immigration in a blow to the president's reform agenda that underscores his inability to build coalitions to pass key legislation. It's a round of thunderous applause in the National Assembly as French MPs adopted a motion to reject the government's flagship immigration bill without even debating it. It's a huge setback for Macron's government and a victory for opposition groups on both the left and right. He wanted to defeat the interior minister, who's long been championing this proposal. It's been a year now that interior minister Darmanin has been pushing this law, so now he can pack up and leave. We are now asking this government to withdraw this law. The move to reject the bill was spearheaded by the Greens and also backed by the far-right national rally, with its leader, Marine Le Pen, delighted. This rejection we've seen tonight is a very powerful rejection. The controversial bill was intended to strengthen the country's ability to expel foreigners it deemed undesirable, increase restrictions on immigration and better integrate current migrants. But the rejection in Parliament does not mean the end of the bill. Macron's government can now decide to send it back to the upper house or ask a joint commission of senators and lawmakers to find a compromise. Or it could be abandoned altogether, though that would be embarrassing for the government.
Moving on now to Israel-Hamas war updates. Israel's defense minister says his troops are on the verge of dismantling a Hamas battalion in northern Gaza. Meanwhile, it was reported that Israel used U.S.-made white phosphorus munitions in an October attack in southern Lebanon that injured at least nine civilians. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said Monday that Israeli troops are encircling Hamas's last two strongholds in northern Gaza, adding that Hamas battalions in the Jabalaya and Shijaya areas are on the verge of dismantling. The defense minister added that the Hamas fighters that have already surrendered said they are short of weapons and food. He went on to say that Israeli forces are near a breaking point in the northern Gaza Strip, calling upon remaining Hamas fighters to surrender as he promised to spare their lives if they do so. The comments come as the Israel Defense Forces and the Israeli Security Agency announced last week that more than 500 Hamas and Islamic Jihad fighters had been captured over the past month. Gaza's health ministry reported that over 18,000 Palestinians have now been killed since the start of the armed conflict. The ministry spokesperson also reported that the bodies of 208 dead Palestinians were transferred to hospitals in the Gaza Strip during the past 24 hours, with over 400 others injured during that time. He called on medical teams around the world to go to the Gaza Strip to help with life-saving operations for the wounded Gazans, stressing that hundreds of wounded people are seeking treatment. Meanwhile, according to a report by the Washington Post on Monday, Israel used U.S.-supplied white phosphorus munitions in an October attack in southern Lebanon that injured at least nine civilians. According to the report, a journalist working for the Post found remnants of three 155-millimeter artillery rounds fired into Deira, near the border of Israel. The attacks incinerated at least four homes. The rounds were said to have been saturated with white phosphorus that burns at high temperatures. Despite accusations of war crimes by human rights groups, the Israel Defense Forces said that white phosphorus shells launched by Israel are used to create smoke screens, not for targeting or causing fires, adding that it complies and goes beyond the requirements of international law. Ukraine's leader Volodymyr Zelensky has made another trip to Washington, D.C. in the U.S. to urge lawmakers to greenlight more military aid for his country as a proposed military aid package remains stalled in Congress. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has arrived in Washington, D.C. on Monday in an attempt to rescue a U.S. defense support package worth $60 billion to Kyiv. The package is currently stalled in U.S. Congress as it's opposed by Republicans who are arguing that more money should be used for domestic security at the U.S.-Mexico border. Zelensky's appeal is seemingly even more crucial as Congress begins its holiday recess at the end of this week. According to a statement by the White House the day before, Zelensky's visit was meant to underscore the United States' unshakable commitment to supporting the people of Ukraine as they defend themselves against Russia's brutal invasion. The arrival of the Ukrainian president makes it his third visit to the U.S. since the war began in February 2022. During Zelensky's speech at the National Defense University in Washington on Monday, he asked for continued support while saying Ukraine has not given up. Ukraines haven't given up and won't give up. We know what to do and you can count on Ukraine and we hope just as much to be able to count on you. He added, when the support of freedom fighters goes down, that is when Russia's dreams come true. Following his remark, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin promised unshakable support for Kyiv. And the United States is proud to stand with you. And make no mistake, America's commitment to supporting Ukraine against Russian aggression is unshakable. Meanwhile, President Zelensky is also set to meet with U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday. They are expected to discuss the U.S.'s ongoing commitment to Ukraine, as well as its country's need for more funds. On to the latest controversy surrounding Russia's Kremlin now. The lawmakers for Alexei Navalny said that they have lost contact with the jailed Russian opposition leader who was believed to be imprisoned in a penal colony about 150 miles east of Moscow, and his whereabouts are currently unknown. Russian opposition politician Alexei Navalny has been removed from the penal colony where he had been imprisoned since last year, his allies said on Monday. They say his current whereabouts are unknown. 
They refused to say where he was transferred, Navalny spokesperson posted on social media after speaking with staff at the IK-6 facility east of Moscow. Aides have been preparing for his expected transfer to a, quote, special regime colony, the harshest grade in Russia's prison system, after he was sentenced in August to an additional 19 years in prison on top of the more than a decade he was already serving. There was no immediate comment from the Kremlin. His disappearance comes at the start of the campaign period for a presidential election in which Vladimir Putin confirmed he would run for another six-year term. With the Kremlin in full control of state media and able to decide who can and cannot run, the Navalny camp says this is not a real election. Hours after the election announcement last Thursday, the opposition camp posted photos on social media of giant blue billboards it had placed in major cities. Under an innocent-looking greeting of Russia Happy New Year were QR codes leading to Navalny's Not Putin website. But the impact was brief as authorities took down the billboards and blocked access to the site. Russian authorities view Navalny and his supporters as extremists, with links to Western intelligence agencies intent on trying to destabilize Russia. Navalny is by far the best-known figure in Russia's opposition. For years, he has branded Putin and the ruling elite as a gang of crooks and thieves, lampooning them in slick videos watched millions of times on YouTube. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Tonight's Road to the White House now. The Supreme Court said that it would consider special counsel Jack Smith's request to rule quickly on whether presidential immunity protects former President Trump from prosecution in the federal 2020 election interference case. It would be the first time that the High Court would have weighed in on part of the legal proceedings involving the former president and Republican presidential frontrunner. The Supreme Court has granted an extraordinary request by special counsel Jack Smith to quickly consider whether to hear arguments and to rule on Donald Trump's claim that he has total immunity from prosecution for anything he did while in the White House. The lower court has already rejected Trump's claim of absolute immunity. Judge Tanya Chutkin writing, being president, quote, does not confer a lifelong get out of jail free pass. But Trump has appealed, a process that could delay the trial in the January 6th election interference case could put it past the 2024 presidential election. In an effort to get ahead of Trump's appeals, Smith went right to the Supreme Court. The United States recognizes this is an extraordinary request, Smith wrote. This is an extraordinary case. Smith says the case is also central to American democracy, writing, a cornerstone of our constitutional order is that no person is above the law. Trump once again said he would be a dictator if he gets back to the White House, but only on his first day in office. You know why I wanted to be a dictator? Because Neither I Trump's legal problems nor his recent controversial comments have hurt his standing as the clear frontrunner for the Republican nomination. In fact, a new poll shows his biggest lead yet in the state that votes first. The Iowa caucuses just five weeks away. One of his rivals, Nikki Haley, was asked about Trump's fitness to serve by our Lindsey Davis. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak faced a rebellion from resistive lawmakers over his signature immigration policy while fending off tough questions about his judgment during the COVID-19 pandemic. The twin pressures add up to one of the toughest weeks of Sunak's 13 months in office with both his present authority and past record at stake. That would see us Britain's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is facing the biggest test in Parliament of his premiership so far with lawmakers on Tuesday voting on its plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. It could be defeated if about 30 Conservative MPs rebel, and that would not only be a huge embarrassment, but also put Sunak's premiership on the line. The scheme was agreed to back in 2022 under Boris Johnson, but a month ago the UK Supreme Court rejected the Conservative government's plan on the grounds that Rwanda is an unsafe place to send asylum seekers after they arrived by small boats to England's southern coast. Sunak reacted by agreeing to a new treaty with Rwanda and brought forward the bill, 
a piece of emergency legislation seeking to override any domestic and international human rights law that prevents the scheme from going ahead. The legislation has deeply divided his party. Moderates worry about Britain breaching its human rights obligations. While the far right says it doesn't go far enough, with some calling for a full rewrite of the legislation on Monday. Defeat would severely weaken Sunak's hold over his party. No government has lost a vote at this earlier stage in the parliamentary process since 1986. And stopping boat rivals has been one of Sunak's main priorities since he replaced Liz Truss as Prime Minister last year. Around 29,000 asylum seekers arrived this year, about one-third less than in 2022, but they remain a highly visible symbol of the government's failure to control Britain's borders, a key promise of campaigners for Brexit. The UN's COP28 climate summit's draft agreement fell short of including a fossil fuel phase-out. Last-minute negotiations will continue for just one more day until the summit comes to a close. On Monday, a new draft of the COP28 agreement was published by the summit president, the United Arab Emirates. It proposed various options and called for reducing the production and consumption of fossil fuels, but the draft did not use the words phase out as seen in previous agreements. An earlier draft on Friday had included phase out, something climate campaigners, low-lying island states and the European Union have been advocating for. But the latest draft calls for reducing the consumption and production of fossil fuels in a just, orderly and equitable manner so as to achieve net zero by, before or around 2050 in keeping with the science. It also provides eight options that countries could use to cut emissions, including tripling renewable energy capacity by 2030 and scaling up technologies to capture CO2 emissions. And on the conference's final day on Tuesday, this year's president emphasized that there's still much to do and no time to waste. We must still close many gaps. We don't have time to waste. We must deliver an outcome that respects the science and that keeps 1.5 within reach. A new draft document is expected early on Tuesday, which would leave little time for further disagreement ahead of the scheduled close of the conference at 11 a.m. local time. Deals at UN climate summits must be passed by consensus by the nearly 200 countries present. Sources familiar with the discussions said the United Arab Emirates had come under pressure from Saudi Arabia to drop any mention of fossil fuels from the text. Saudi Arabia is the de facto leader of the OPEC oil producers group, of which the UAE is a member. Despite the rapid growth of renewable energy use, around 80 percent of the world's energy is produced using fossil fuels. The Polish parliament has given former Prime Minister Donald Tusk a mandate to form a new coalition government. It will put an end to the eight-year rule of the right-wing nationalist Law and Justice Party, which repeatedly clashed with EU authorities. He's a centrist pro-European political veteran who's expected to mend Polish ties with Brussels. Donald Tusk first launched into politics as a student activist in the 1980s joining the Solidarity protest movement against communist rule in his hometown of Gdansk. In 2001, he co-founded the Civic Platform. Six years later, the party would go on to win elections in 2007, defeating the Law and Justice Party. For many weeks, we were convincing Poles that life in Poland may be better, that Poles deserve a good, decent government and a better life. For six years, Tusk led Poland as prime minister. In the top job, he shunned big projects, focusing instead on raising living standards in the country with the help of EU funds. In 2014, he left for Brussels to become the head of the European Council. The PIS accused Tusk of abandoning Poland to become Germany's puppet in the EU. In Brussels, the former Prime Minister fought hard to be viewed as a tough leader. During Brexit negotiations, he hit out at British leaders who campaigned for the country's departure from the bloc. I've been wondering what that special place in hell looks like for those who promoted Brexit without even a sketch of a plan how to carry it safely.
In 2021, Tusk made his political comeback in Poland. In his absence, the right-wing Law and Justice Party grew in popularity and Tusk was determined to oust his long-standing nemesis. He got his chance during elections in October of this year. The PIS won the vote with over 35%, but a Tusk-led alliance won a clear majority of seats in Parliament. I have been a politician and a sportsman for many years. I have never been so happy in my life with this second place. Poland has won. Democracy has won. We removed them from power. Following elections, the country's president, Andrzej Duda, gave the incumbent prime minister, Mateusz Morawiecki, leader of the PIS, the first chance at forming a government, a move seen as a delaying tactic. What happens next in Poland matters beyond the country's borders, with both the EU and war-torn Ukraine keeping their eyes on Warsaw. Welcome back. Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived in Vietnam today for a state visit. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. Swiss police said that a suspect was arrested after he shot two people dead and wounded a third in the Swiss outline town of Sion. Scores of first responders sifted through debris to ensure all survivors were accounted for after a building partially collapsed in the Bronx, New York, USA. Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived in Hanoi, capital of Vietnam, today for a two-day state visit. The two sides will discuss upgrading China-Vietnam relations. Today, a Japanese court found three former soldiers guilty of sexually assaulting a female colleague in a landmark victory for the victim whose battle for justice challenged taboos in a traditional male dominant. Society. Residents in North East Australia braced today for heavy rain and damaging winds from Cyclone Justin. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. Tonight, we're leaving you in Hong Kong as Disneyland celebrated the start of the Christmas season with a Disney star-studded live concert and a dazzling drone show. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>